Well, as I said, this afternoon they had the debate between the three candidates who are Gary Nolan, Aaron Russo, and Michael Badnerick. And the horse race appeared to be a fight between Nolan and Russo going into the debate with Badnerick running third. But Badnerick made a very good showing in the debate, and so he may do better tomorrow than he was touted to do before the debate. As far as how the debate went, it's a little bit difficult to give a really good answer to the question of how it went, but I would say that on the level of how this went over on C-SPAN and how it helped to sell libertarian ideas, I think all three candidates did very, very well. Uh, on the basis of what they were there for, which is to get votes from the delegates to get the nomination tomorrow, I have to say that I don't think any one of the three candidates shown on that basis. The purpose, the first and primary purpose of any candidate who's been working for six months or a year or a year and a half to get this nomination is to get the delegates to vote for you. And all three of the candidates found themselves much more addressing the C-SPAN audience in order to sell libertarian ideas, and not one of the three ever really made much of a case for why he should be the nominee. But it was very interesting. The uh, moderator of the debate was a reporter from the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, and he asked the kind of questions you would expect an outsider to ask uh, what America should be doing in Iraq, and of course everybody knew in advance what the answers were going to be from all three candidates, and that was get out of Iraq and get out quickly. And then he would ask questions about, well, what other trouble spots are coming up in the future that uh, America should be on the watch for and where America may get involved. And, of course, all three candidates said America should bring all its troops home from all its overseas bases and quit meddling in the affairs of other countries. So there are no other places, and there wouldn't be trouble spots for Americans if, in fact, America were not out in the world looking for trouble. So that's the way it went, and as I said, Badnerick probably did better than he was expected to do, and so it may be more of a three-way race tomorrow than was expected to be. It is my expectation that no one will get a first ballot nomination, but after the first ballot, if Badnerick is in third place, he probably will withdraw and urge his delegates to vote for Gary Nolan. And then the question will be, will the delegates follow his advice, or will they think their second choice is Aaron Russo? And... So it will be up for grabs perhaps on the second ballot. I doubt that it will go more than two ballots, but it's difficult to say. The rules call for withdrawing people from the bottom of the order only after two ballots. But there are six candidates altogether, and three of them have not garnered enough support to be eligible to be in today's debate and probably will not have enough support to be eligible even to be nominated from the podium tomorrow. What happens is you begin the morning session tomorrow with nominating and seconding speeches for the three main candidates, and then you have the roll call of votes. But if some of those bottom three candidates get votes enough to keep somebody from getting a first ballot nomination and then stay in on the second ballot, it could go even to three or four ballots. I hope that it doesn't because I don't want to spend my day listening to Alabama cast its three or six votes for so-and-so or whatever it may be. That gets very tiresome very quickly. So, But it uh, seems to have been a good convention. I have not been able to hear many of the speeches, uh, but I was told that Mary Ruart gave a wonderful keynote speech to begin it, and I'm going to get a video of it so that I can watch it over the next week or two, because I have heard her speak, and she is a, a wonderful speaker. And I've heard that uh, a few others were good speakers. I did go to a luncheon where somebody from the Sierra Club came to speak about the environment, and he was invited specifically because the person who invited him felt that there were overlapping interests between the Sierra Club and the Libertarian Party. In other words, this individual from Sierra Club had some free market solutions to environmental problems. But he also pointed out that he didn't think that somebody owns, who owns a mountain should be able to do whatever he wants with that mountain. And if somebody owns property that has a lake in it uh, that has an endangered species on it, he doesn't have the right to do whatever he wants with that endangered species. What he didn't say, but what was lurking in the background all the time was, well, if he doesn't have the right to do what he wants with his own property, then who is it who has the right to decide what he can do with his own property? And while it was not mentioned, the obvious answer is the government. And who do we mean by the government? Well, we mean George Bush or Bill Clinton or Al Gore or Trent Lott or Newt Gingrich or Teddy Kennedy. And do we really want people like that making decisions about what people can do with their property? Are they going to take better care of property than people are going to take care of their own property? I really don't think so. So the, the impression that I was left with was there is not such a great overlapping uh, confluence of interest between the Sierra Club and the Libertarian Party. And uh, the Sierra Club man was very, very head up about global warming and felt that this was probably the number one issue of the day and that our government had to do something about global warming. And, of course, this went over like a lead balloon with the libertarian audience at the banquet there at the luncheon where he spoke. Aside from that, I think that it's probably been a very interesting convention. The turnout was much larger than was expected, and nobody seems to have an explanation why there was a sudden burst of registrations for the convention this last week. But in any event, uh, it's been an exciting time, and tomorrow is going to be very exciting. Tomorrow night we're having the closing banquet when we will honor the presidential nominee, 
and they will give awards for uh, various service that have, services that have been performed to the Libertarian cause, and I will be fortunate to be the MC of the banquet, and I'm looking forward to that. Meanwhile, of course, a lot of other things have been going on in the world. The world has not stopped for the Libertarian Convention. And one of the things that I noticed this past week was Bill O'Reilly interviewing somebody about the torture at the prison in Iraq. And O'Reilly was at great pains to point out that these people in the prison, these are not just bank robbers, these are terrorists. And if they have information to give, then why shouldn't you torture them? Why shouldn't you cause them all kinds of grief in order to get that information to save lives? What O'Reilly does not seem to understand is that these people are not terrorists, they are suspected terrorists. And the reason we have a Bill of Rights, the reason we have a rule of law, the reason we have rules of evidence is to be able to determine who is a terrorist and who isn't, who is a bank robber and who isn't. And only after you have done that can you say that somebody deserves to be tortured or whatever it is you have in mind for them. We do have an email from Rick who refers to an article on Lou Rockwell's site, which is lourockwell.com, an article by Butler Schaefer in which he says, quote, Mrs. Albright, meaning Madeleine Albright, Bill Clinton's Secretary of State, was asked by 60 Minutes reporter Leslie Stahl, we have heard that half a million children died. That refers to the sanctions that were placed on Iraq for 10 years after the Gulf War. And Leslie Stahl said, we have heard that half a million children died. That's more children than died in Hiroshima. Is the price worth it? And Albright replied, we think the price is worth it. You may have heard that quote before. That's a very insightful quote because it comes right back to this business with O'Reilly and people talking about the Iraq War. It is so easy to talk about the need for people to sacrifice, for some people have to die, that there has to be collateral damage and everything is worth it, and freedom for the Iraqi people is worth the price that's being paid and all of these other things. But the fact is that you're talking about other people dying. You're talking about other people sacrificing. You're not talking about you going over there with a gun and sacrificing your freedom and maybe your life to make this happen. And all these people who think that this is worth it think it is worth it only because it is somebody else that's going to pay the price. And the old expression is, you can't make an omelet without breaking a few eggs. And, of course, it's always somebody else's eggs that are going to be broken. And on top of that, somehow the omelet never materializes when it's all over. Just as the Gulf War did not bring freedom to the Middle East, this war has not brought the results that were intended for it. The war in Afghanistan didn't bring the results that were intended for it. There's civil war there going on now, and the only reason we're not being inundated with news about it is because all the news is coming from Iraq. But the fact of the matter is that government doesn't work. The government that is supposed to bring peace to the Middle East is the same government that was supposed to bring us a drug-free America 40 years ago, and after 40 years, drug use is much greater than it was before the drug war started. It's the same government that was going to cure illiteracy and leave no child behind, and yet every year comes back for more money because the schools are in worse condition than they were the year before. It's the same government that 40 years ago declared war on poverty, and Lyndon Johnson, the president, said... The days of the dole are numbered. He forgot to tell us that the number was one million that he was thinking of. But the fact of the matter is that it's the same government. The Defense Department is simply the post office in fatigues. And to think that our government is going to go around the world and make everything all right for everybody else when it can't make everything all right for people in the United States is just simply absurd. President Bush, after 9-11, said we're going to rid the world of evildoers. Hey, great. If you know how to do that, why don't you start with Washington, D.C.? Why don't you just simply get the criminals off the street in Washington, D.C., if you know how to do that? That's the crime capital of the world. And if you can clean up Washington, D.C., then maybe the people in Arkansas will ask you to come down and work your magic there. And if you can do it in Arkansas, then maybe Idaho will ask you for it. And maybe, maybe within five years or ten years, we'll have rid of all the evildoers in the United States. And then maybe the people in Canada will say, come and help us out in Canada. You're so good at this. And then it will go on around the world and maybe in the next, oh, what, 3,000 years, we'll have cleaned up all the evildoers out of all, all the world. It's crazy. How is it that people can recognize that you have to stand in line forever at the post office when you don't have to stand in line for Dell Computer or Microsoft or somebody else, and you have to wait forever at the Department of Motor Vehicles, and you have to uh, go through insane things when you're trying to get a license to build something, add it onto your house or whatever, that government is such a morass of red tape and bureaucratic regulations and mistakes and problems and corruption and graft and everything else. But somehow when we talk about the military and this great, great force that's going to go around the world and bring freedom to everybody, it's the same government, folks, and it isn't going to work. And those 500 children who died in Iraq were not worth any price. It wasn't worth the death of one child. All that happened was that we created terrorists around this world by throwing our weight around, and now we are paying the price for it. But the problem is that it is always the innocent who have to pay the price for what the guilty have done. And the guilty, of course, are the people in our government, Republicans and Democrats alike, who thought they knew so much better than the rest of the world how everything should be ordered and how... Peace can be brought to the Middle East with the right roadmap. And how the problems of Serbia and the Armenians and the Bosnians and the Croats, all that can be settled in Serbia. And all of this, just around the world, and none of it ever produces any lasting peace. It is, as the historian Charles Beard said, the perpetual war for perpetual peace. And, of course, the peace never comes. Let's go now to Eric in Awataki, Arizona. Eric, you with us. Good evening. 
I, 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 as usual, are agreeing with, with 99% to 100% of all, of all of what you're saying. And i got to say, I'm a Nader man, first off. You might, you might have remembered me from... Oh, yes, from last week. Uh, I asked you to call back because we were running out of time. But, but, I, but I'm agreeing um, with, with the prison situation uh, insofar as that. Did you see that the, um, the prisoners that we re- released this past week, they, they had a release of prisoners. So it seems now that those uh, prison uh, keepers are also acting as judge and juries because they're, they're processing them out and everything, and we didn't get to hear about any trials or anything like that. Yeah, you're making a very good point uh that uh, it was when I heard the figure, it's been several days, and I've been out of touch for the last three or four days being in Atlanta. <laughs> Not that Atlanta is out of touch, but I have been out of touch. But uh, it seemed to me that when I heard the figures, it's they were substantial numbers of prisoners that had been released from the prisons, and they never did explain whether these people had been processed, whether they've been investigated, or anything else. And you've got to figure that some of those prisoners who were released were ones that uh, on whom those abuses were committed. So these people were in effect abused before anybody even knew whether they were innocent or guilty. And I also equate this. With, with just another ba- uh, reason why the Patriot Act is bad insofar as that uh, it's given police the right to act uh, uh, as a SWAT team insofar as that they can bust inside your apartment or house uh, with, 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 uh, without a warrant. And basically, um, what they've, been, they've actually been doing this in New York City. I've been watching uh, free speech television on Dem- Democracy Now!, and they busted in one one place thinking that there was terrorists in there, and they end up giving this old man a heart attack. And oh, yeah. Up, it, was, it was the wrong, you know. Yeah, so. and, and, of course, that's happened for years in the war on drugs, in a, uh, incidents like that, and now it's all been transferred from the war on drugs to the war on terrorism. You know, it's an interesting thing. I've, of course, been following these things for about 45 or 50 years, and for so many years conservatives warned us about the man on the white horse syndrome, that you've got to beware of the man on the white horse who comes along and says he's going to cure all our problems and make us safe and give us security and everything else. Well, guess what? The man on the white horse has arrived, and the conservatives are cheering him. Well, now the Pope, he came out and said that we have to be careful because it looks like we're becoming a nation full of soulless people. And I really don't think he's talking about the 200 million people that live here. I think he's talking about our leaders. Our government. No question about it. We're on the wrong path. Yeah, no question about it. Uh, Eric, thanks so much for your comments. I'm glad you called. Thank you, sir. Let's go now to Fall River, Massachusetts, and we'll try to stay away from the Salem Witch Trials, but we'll see what's going on with Ad, uh, with Matthew in Fall River, Massachusetts. Good evening, Matthew. Hi, Ms. Brown. Aren't you somewhere near Salem? Uh, about a uh, little, about an hour and a half, two hours. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, for some reason or other, I've always associated Fall River with Salem. Well, <laughs> you know, this uh, whole area here is kind of the People's Republic of Massachusetts. Sure. Uh, well, geography is not my expertise. <laughs> Basketball is. Go ahead. Well, just, uh, you know, I met you in 2000, and uh, you signed your book for me, great, the great libertarian author, and, uh, you know, I really appreciated that. And uh, I saw you, I'm not sure where I saw you speak. I think it was in Stoughton, and uh, you did a great job. And it's, I voted for you in 96 and in 2000. And Terrific, but don't vote for me this year. Oh, uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> you know, if uh, Aaron Russo was going to be on the ballot, I was thinking of writing your name in, but no, that's <laughs> <laughs> That's not what I was going to do, but uh, I'm a Gary Nolan supporter. But um, yeah. and I was just kind of, uh, you know, just wanted to call because I watched the, I watched the uh, convention today, the the, the debates. And uh, how much of it uh, was? How much uh, coverage did C-SPAN have today? I have, I know they were covering the debates because I saw all the cameras there. And did they cover anything else today? They, that well, you saw? No, just the debates. Okay. Yeah, I was I was wanting more of the whole convention, but they. Uh, yeah, they'll probably cover the voting tomorrow morning. That's what they said. On, that's what it says. And the session, uh, just for your information, is supposed to start at 9 a.m. Right. Eastern time. That would be 6 a.m. Pacific time for those of you in California, Oregon, and Washington. But uh, if you'd like to see it, it probably will be pretty dramatic. Yeah. yeah and um, so I was I was uh, Im- impressed with that Eric more so than I thought I was going to be, and. Uh, Impressed that Aaron Russo didn't embarrass himself more than I thought he was going to. <laughs> we were uh, all sitting there with our fingers crossed. Yeah, was, some some really, with their fingers crossed, hoping yeah. he wouldn't, and some hoping he would. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I want you know, I, you know, I, I was hoping for the best from uh, from Mr. Russo, and uh, I got what I thought was a great job from Gary Nolan, um, and uh, really was impressed with him. I thought he had a, a very presidential demeanor, which what I was is what I was looking for. I think so too. One thing that I didn't uh, think to mention in the beginning of the show when I talked about the, the debate today is the one thing that they. Uh, no, Bad Narek didn't do it, but uh, Aaron and Gary did do, which I think is very bad, mm-hmm. is to say, when I am president, I am going to do this, that, or whatever it is. And it came up several times. And as best I, as I recall, Michael Bad Narek did not do that. And mm-hmm. I think it is a very bad thing for a libertarian candidate to do. Mm-hmm. What the individual should say is, a libertarian president would not do this. A libertarian president would bring the troops home immediately. The libertarian president would let all the, the nonviolent drug prisoners out of prison immediately. And if by some miracle, I should be elected president. I would do this. But to, to do it as though you were the Republican or Democratic candidate and had an even chance to win defies credibility. And it makes people who are non-libertarians watching it on television 
begin to think you people aren't in the real world. You're talking like you're going to get elected president, and you know you don't have a chance to do that. And it also affects the libertarians in the audience, because down deep inside, even though they want a libertarian president, they know they're not going to get one this year. And they're not even going to come close in that they would be tickled pink if the libertarian pre- uh, candidate got 5%. They got a hard back if he got 5%. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't do that. We need the, we need all the listeners we can get. But, no, but I, mean, I think the idea, for me, seeing that, I think the perspective was that they were trying to um, act like they were going to get it. So like they were trying to act like real candidates. Right, right. And, that's and like they that. are real candidates. Yeah. And there is so much a libertarian candidate can do. The running a presidential campaign is very important for the libertarian party. I agree. And it's, it's the biggest advertisement. Absolutely. I think you can possibly get And that's why it's very important to, to select the right kind of person. And it's very important that that person be promoting the libertarian label all the time and talking about the fact that this is what a libertarian would do. This is the way a, a libertarian president would handle it. This is the libertarian solution to this problem. So that people begin to realize that there is a whole school of thought that looks to individuals and responsibility in the free market to solve problems and never looks to government as the solution to anything. And once they realize that, then when they see, uh, maybe they won't vote for the libertarian presidential candidate, but they go into the, the polling booth, and they say, oh my goodness, there's a libertarian running for state rep here. Right. Uh, I don't know any of these people. I'll vote for the libertarian. Right. Uh, yeah, oh, here's a libertarian running for city council. Uh, well, why not? I'll vote for the libertarian. Mm-hmm. And not only that, of course, by promoting the libertarian label, he's building the party to the point where someday we may be big enough exactly. to be able to challenge the Republicans and Democrats. But it's very important to do this, and only the presidential candidate is going to get on Fox TV News or Hannity and Combs or uh, get on the Larry King Show or any of these national television shows, and it is the one chance that we have to do that kind of advertising, as you put it. So yeah. you're right on there. And there's just one, there's one more thing I've I don't want to hold up the lines, but I do want to. I'm not sure where this whole Nader thing is coming from. It's kind of spooking me. Uh, Nader does not represent libertarianism. He is about the he's a big polar, government man. polar opposite of sure. everything that we stand for. Um, these people that think that he's somehow the best candidate for us uh, need to take a breath. Yeah. No, well, there's there's no chance that libertarians would buy that. No, I, but, I know. It's just uh, I'm not sure. It's where interesting I, that you brought this up, though. Days, so, like last weekend, these two people called in a row saying that. Yeah, I know. That, you know, I kind of. Uh, I just. Wondering where that came from, you know. But he's... you're having brought this up. Let me say this: that the interesting thing is that Nader actually represents the traditional democratic views on things, oh, civil yeah. liberties, peace rather than war, some of these other matters that used to be traditional democratic things. But now that the Democratic and Republican parties have virtually merged yeah. into one party with just two factions in it, uh, where they both are for corporate welfare, they're both for big spending government, they're both for intrusions on civil liberties, they're both for going to war, they're both for all of these things, and there's no distinction between them. All Nader has done is to pick up the mantle of the traditional uh, democratic views, and of course on the other side, you have people like Howard Phillips of the Constitution Party, which had picked up the traditional conservative viewpoint towards smaller government and so forth. And they're both marginalized. And, and then, of course, what you have is the libertarians who, on all issues at all times, look to free individuals to solve problems and not to the government to do it. Yep. Matthew, thanks so much for calling. Uh, we'll look forward to hearing from you again in the Absolutely. future. And Kayleen, Kayleen has called in before, and she's my wife. Oh, she is. She yeah, is. she's a very nice woman. Yeah, um, she is. You're a lucky uh, man. She, she, loves you to, she loves you to pieces. Harry. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> we both give her, do. Give her my best, and thanks so much for calling. All right. Have a good night. You bet. Let's talk now with Jack in Blountville, Tennessee. Jack, where is Blountville? Well, it's around the uh, Virginia-Tennessee border. Oh, okay. Well, you're quite a ways away from me. I'm in Nashville, which is Middle Tennessee. Uh, well, but I hadn't heard of Blountville before. It's a small town. It's in between the cities of Kingsport, Johnson City, and Christmas, Oh, yeah. It's, like, yeah. It's, right in the middle of it. it's a small little town. Okay. Anyway, What's on your mind tonight? Well, I was just, you know, I've uh, been uh, intrigued by the Libertarian Party, and I don't really understand all what they stand for. But I, I, you know, what I'm trying to say is that... Uh, the United States has gone into Iraq, and the real problem is Iran. That Why is do you think Iran is a problem? Well, because uh, uh, they are the, the, the basic uh, sponsors, and openly do it. They, they sponsor terrorism around the world. They ship, you know, arms to the Pakistanis, the, the uh, Palestinians, everywhere, you know, and they openly boast of doing this. But the United States, instead of taking on, like they say, the uh, terrorist and the terrorist war, they, they haven't gone to the heart of the problem. There was no terrorism, really, in this world until the Shah of Iran was, was removed. And uh, Khomeini came in. Yeah, but you, you do understand that one of the reasons the Iranians were so upset was because it was a U.S. engineered coup that put the Shah in there and replaced the only democratic Arab government that there has been, I think, in the history of the world. And that okay. was in Iran up until 1953 when the U.S. helped overthrow the government in order to put the Shah in. And the whole reason was because the government of Iran was threatening to nationalize the oil industry there. I'm happy to see some new callers tonight. One of them, I believe, is C.A. in Scottsdale, Arizona. Good evening, C.A. All right, don't worry. I've called you before, but uh, it's always very interesting. It's always good to hear your viewpoints. I love the way you challenge the intellect, and, you know, it makes you kind of formidable. I see why a lot of these people, I bet you they won't even, um, they couldn't face you man to man, you know, in a, in, a, in a form of ideas. I just like to say I enjoy your program immensely, and uh, go get some more callers. And please tell these people at 1310 to run your whole two hours. One hour is not enough. Oh, what's the, sta- what's the station there that uh, you're talking about? 1310 KXAM. 
KXAM. In Scottsdale. Right. Okay. I appreciate your mentioning that. They're just running an hour. All right, sir. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate the comments. Okay. And I didn't really finish my thought about Iran, which just requires one or two more sentences, and that is that Jack, uh, when he called in, mentioned that we didn't have a problem with terrorism until the Shah was overthrown. But when the Shah was overthrown and the Iranians felt a little bit freer to respond finally to what had happened, the first thing they did was to go to the U.S. Embassy and take the people there hostage. And the reason they went to the embassy was because that's where the, the coup was executed from back in 1953. And, of course, Americans had very, very little knowledge of this at all. Or let me rephrase that. Very few Americans knew anything about it. But you know darn well that the Iranians did. And even though it was 26 years later, they hadn't forgotten. These things get passed down from generation to generation. And people keep these hatreds, these desires for revenge forever. And, of course, it doesn't make what the terrorists did in taking the American embassy people hostage right. That was wrong. But you can at least understand why they were opposed to Americans and not to Canadians, not to Scotch people, not to people from Brazil or somewhere else. All right, we've got time for one more call in this hour, and that's from Jeremy in Tappahannock. Uh, Tappahannock. Very good, Jeremy. Tappahannock, Virginia. Got it. Okay. Uh, I just a good old Irish name. A, I just realized you have a radio show, and I'm so happy about that. I uh, first met you in 2000 during your, your campaign in Northern Virginia, and I just want to thank you for all your work that you've done for the Libertarian Party. Um, most of your viewpoints are the same viewpoints as mine, or have formed my viewpoints, and I just want to tell you how happy I am that you have a radio show and I can call in and talk to you again. Terrific. I'm glad you do. Uh, what um, what uh, specifically is on your mind tonight? Well, um, since I first became a Libertarian, uh, I've been doing some reading about um, issues dealing with corporations, and I just wanted to get your viewpoints on some things. Sure. Um, one of the things I've been reading about is the doctrine of limited liability, mm -hmm. and this is something that I think whenever I talk about with libertarians, it always does kind of strike a chord in some terms because, uh, you know, it sort of flies in the face of the fact that we think that, you know, the rights that you have come with responsibilities. And anytime, you know, any sort of limit in liability, just, you know, as a doctrine, is sort of... Is sort you of think weird. it's irresponsible? Right. All right. Yeah, it would be irresponsible if it were unilateral, but it isn't unilateral. If I set up a corporation, I inform you by the fact of setting up a corporation that the liability is limited. And if you're going to extend me credit... You're going to do it with your eyes open, knowing that the liability is limited, that if the corporation fails, you can't come after my personal assets. That was part of the deal from the get-go. So nobody has been deceived by it. Nobody has been defrauded by it. What would be fraud would be to, uh, as an individual, without having a formal limited liability status, to run up debts and then say, I'm not going to pay them. I didn't really intend to do this, or I didn't want to do it, or it didn't work out the way I wanted, and therefore I'm not going to pay my debts. That would be irresponsible. But the whole concept of limited liability came into existence as a way of being able to harness great sums of money to do great things, like building dams or telephone companies or automobile companies that couldn't be done with only one person's fortune. And this was a way of combining assets from people. Did that make any sense? Oh, it made complete sense. There was just uh, two things I wanted to add to that. Um, the first is what you would do in the case of third parties, because that was most libertarian degrees, I think, in the case of the two parties enter into the agreement on any, you know, transaction, that they would know that limited liability was in effect. But, you know, if, in, say, like an environmental case where somebody was damaged by a corporation dumping or something and they weren't party to that agreement, mm -hmm. you know, what would, what would happen in that case? Well, I understand what you're saying. The... I still think that you could not hold the individuals responsible or the individual shareholders because if you did, all you'd need would be two or three cases like that and you'd never be able to raise money for any large venture again. But I think that the, to a certain extent, would, go ahead, what were you going to say? Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but you don't think that would deter some of these more um, egregious acts from occurring? It may be, I'm not saying this is definitely a good idea, but it is something that started occurring to me that maybe holding shareholders a little bit more responsible might might uh, result in better actions like corporations maybe? Well, I don't know. But I think that it. that's too indirect uh, a method to try to do it. I think that what needs to be done is that if somebody has been materially harmed is that the particular managers who are responsible for this, if it can be proven that it was done intentionally and brought harm to somebody else's property, it doesn't really matter whether they were doing it as individuals or as agents of corporations. They have acted in a manner that we would consider illegal in the sense that they have intruded on somebody else's property and that it is more important to hold the managers responsible. But, you know, there is very, very little of such actions by corporations in this country when you compare it with the actions of government agencies. It is the government agencies that are creating most of the pollution in this country. For example, it is a government agency that allows a corporation to come in and dump toxic waste into the government's river or to clear cut on the government's national park or to overgraze on the government's federal lands. And the federal government and local governments are the worst caretakers possible because no one is personally responsible. No one loses value if the property is destroyed. You would never let somebody do to your front lawn or your back lawn or your house in any way what government managers allow people to do to government property. Uh, the, and they do it because they bear no consequences for their actions whatsoever. And in the same way, corporations are in, intentionally responsible to a much greater degree because the corporation is liable. Now, maybe 
uh, a suit would be brought and the damages would far exceed the corporation's assets and, or net worth, and the result would be that because you can't go after the individual shareholders, the people who have been harmed would not get full value, uh, full restitution for what had happened to them. But that's a very, very rare case. That's a lifeboat case. What does happen is that the corporation harms somebody by its actions and it loses a great deal of money in a court case or something else, and the managers get fired or the managers lose their bonuses, or the manager's stock, op uh, stock options become worth a heck of a lot less than they were before this suit was brought and the damages brought. And that's what deters the corporations far more than the possibility that the individual shareholders may get approached to lose some of their personal assets. Do you understand what I'm saying? I understand completely. Do I understand? Yeah, I think I do, too. <laughs> uh, I, I Sometimes I do question whether that's as, as good a deterrent as, as we think it is, because I think that's the best we have to work with right now, too. I don't think that the yeah. government has a solution to this problem any more than you do. Sure. Um, and that's always what we must remember when people say, that's not good enough. Well, the alternative is, let's have Teddy Kennedy take care of it for us. Yeah. Is, is that better? <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely realize that corporation or government is, uh, is distorting the picture a lot more than they're making things clear about who's responsible in certain cases. Right. Um, if you were producing some kind of product and toxic waste is, was a byproduct of it, and there's nothing wrong with toxic waste it, per se, the problem is where the toxic waste is put. And most corporations and most companies have ways of disposing of toxic waste in a, in a way that is safe and, and so on. But if there happens to be a river right next door to the corporation and the government managers of that river, and the river is owned by the government, no individual owns that river, therefore it is government property. And if the government managers have no objections whatsoever to you dropping toxic waste in there for 20 years, uh, that's a heck of a lot cheaper than having to go to the uh, problem of digging underground shelters for it and to, to dispose of it in a, a much more careful way. Uh, you're going to do it. But the problem is not the people who are dumping the waste. It's the people who let them dump the waste, the people who, in effect, are, are stewards of that property by being the government managers and who let them get away with it. And those people should be fired at the very least. Maybe they should even be fined. Maybe they should even go to jail. I don't know. But the, the most important thing is that we have to recognize where the responsibility lies. And if you just think about all of the terrible scandals that have occurred in the environment, they have almost all occurred on government property. You don't hear about real problems in privately owned forests. You hear about all sorts of problems in national parks. You don't hear about overgrazing on private property. You hear about it have, taking place on federal lands. You don't hear about strip mining at Phelps Dodge's mines in Bisbee, Arizona. What you hear about is strip mining on government property through sweetheart deals that have been arranged with companies by government manager. Obviously, the problem lies with government ownership of property, and what we should be trying to do if we really are concerned about the environment is to get as much property as possible out of the hands of government and into the hands of individuals who will worry themselves to death about the future value of that property. When you buy a house, the first thing you're thinking about is, what's this property going to be worth five years or ten years from now when I sell it? That's why I mow the lawn every week. That's why I do this with it. That's why I make sure there are no termites and on and on and on, because the last thing you want is to have the property deteriorate in value during the time you have it and not get your money back when you sell it or even not make a profit. But if you're talking about government property and you just happen to be the person who's put in charge of it, uh, what do you care what happens to it? Just so long as you don't lose your job, and it's pretty darn hard to lose your job. So anyway, thanks for calling and raising the question, Jeremy. It's a very interesting question, and there are no final answers to it, but we know this, that uh, we're not going to get very far by turning this over to George Bush or Bill Clinton. Absolutely. Thanks for all your work for Liberty, too. I do appreciate it. You bet. But let's talk now with Doris in Fort Charlotte, Florida. Doris, you with us? Yes, I am. I'm sorry you had to wait so long on the well, telephone, but I'm glad you're with us. All right. I just wanted to say I had affiliation with the Republican Party for 35 years, and I got so fed up that I canceled it and went independent. But I figured I'd hold my nose and vote Democrat. But John Kerry, the choice? <laughs> I mean, from bad to worse, we need a third party. Yes, I think I've uh, had that feeling myself. <laughs> How do we go about getting it? Well, Doris, what you have to realize is that the Republicans and Democrats do not have a two-party system because the public said, oh, please give us a two-party system. We are dying to have a two-party system. It exists because there are laws that the Democrats and Republicans have passed that make it very, very difficult for third parties to get on the ballot so that instead of spending the money they raise on advertising, they have to spend it on getting ballot status in the 50 states. The campaign finance laws, which supposedly are such inconveniences for the Republican and Democratic candidates, have limited George Bush to only raising $200 million this year and John Kerry to only raising $100 million or, or so. But in fact, do present a real burden to third-party candidates because a third-party candidate with so little chance of winning cannot go to a law firm that has 100 attorneys and just speak to the managing partner and say, will you pledge $2,000 for each one of your 100 partners? And say, yeah, sure, and get $200,000 in one phone call, but instead have to plot it out person by person by person. And so if John Kerry can raise $100 million, a third-party candidate's lucky if he raises 2 or $3 million. Well, I hope I win the uh, lottery. I'll help you. <laughs> Yeah, so anyway, I'm just telling you what the problems are, but that doesn't mean it's hopeless. It just means that it's not going to be cured by some quick silver bullet that's suddenly going to make everything all right if just the right person runs, if just the, if the, just the right message is given. It's going to take time, and it's going to take hard work, and it's going to take your help and my help and the help of a lot of other people. But it can be done. I'm not telling you it will be done. I'm just simply telling you it can be done, and I hope you won't give up hope. 
I know, but at times I feel like we have Democrats and a Democrat, the, 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 you know, just the opposite. Yeah, the of one course. Party. No, of course, you're absolutely right. And Democrats and Democrats. Yes, and uh, you're right when you think, gee, I'd vote for anybody but Bush. Well, wait a minute. Would I vote for John Kerry? <laughs> the only thing, the only hope you have, the only way your vote will not be misinterpreted is to either vote libertarian or don't vote at all. And there is nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with not voting at all. Because if you vote for the wrong person, you're only encouraging him to continue doing the wrong thing. I happen to think, well, I didn't really have to think. My lovely wife Pamela happened to think and poked me in the ribs and said, you know, there may be a lot of people listening to the show tonight who don't know about the Libertarian Party and don't realize what it is you're talking about. Very briefly, the Libertarian Party is a party that is advancing the Libertarian movement, and a Libertarian is someone who thinks that you ought to be able to live your life the way you want to live it, not as John Kerry or George Bush thinks is best for you. A Libertarian thinks that you should be able to raise your children the way you want to, that you should not have to pay school taxes, that you should be able instead to keep your own money and put your child in the school of your choice and pay for it directly so that you can demand what you want from the people providing your child's education and not be subject to Board of Education bureaucrats and politicians who are trying to create a brave new world with your child as a pawn. Libertarians believe that... You're the one who gets up every day. You're the one who goes to work. You're the one who puts in 8 or 10 or 12 hours a day. So you should be able to keep every single dollar of what you earn. Spend it, save it, give it away as you think best, not as the politicians think that it should be done, not letting the politicians take 20, 30, 40% of your income and then dole a little of it back to you like you were a child on an allowance. That's what libertarianism is all about. And when I was talking earlier about the Libertarian Party Convention, which is on right now in Atlanta where I am, these are people, there were a thousand of them there today, who believe that you have the right to live your life as you want to live it, just so long as you do not intrude on someone else's person or property without his permission. So now that we have that straight, let's go to Austin, Texas, and talk with Terry. Good evening, Terry. Well, good evening. And um, I do have a bone to pick with you, but before I pick that bone, I want to make sure your audience is uh, periodically reminded that you were one of the few brave and conscientious voices right after 9-11 uh, that uh, did not get stampeded into uh, endorsing murderous and brutal revenge. Uh, you actually stood for civilized justice. Um, and uh, whatever, whatever, whatever bone I'm going to pick with you here, uh, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll always have that, uh, which is an extremely important thing. And by the way, you're at a convention and you brought your wife, so that must be a very romantic marriage. <laughs> I take her to all the romantic places. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, libertarians can be romantic, I guess, in, in terms of our politics. Um, well, it depends on who you're married to, for one thing, and I'm very, very fortunate. Um, the bone I have to pick with you is on the liability uh, about corporations. Mm -hmm. We can't have it both ways. Um, we want people who are listening to us as libertarians, and you're a long-term libertarian, and so, and so am I. Uh, we want them to, uh, in some cases, they're going to have to give up some of the things that are important to them if they want to uh, be able to uh, be in this truce with everybody else. It, it has to be reciprocal. If we're going to be one of the owners of a corporation and enjoy the profits of that corporation, when we have, you know, we have a share of ownership. Uh, I think it's not libertarian to also equally share in the liability if it screws up. Well, you do share in the liability. You pay ten thousand dollars for a share of the ownership of a corporation, and if the corporation screws up, you can lose your whole ten thousand dollars. You are not without great risk when you invest in a corporation. The question is, however. Should it be possible for somebody, a corporation or even a limited partnership, to simply say to the world, we have limited liability here, and if you want to extend us credit, you have to understand that if the corporation's assets run out, we are not making our personal assets available to you to settle this debt. I, I and anybody can say, I don't want to do business with you under those circumstances. I agree with you on that. That's not a problem because that's disclosed, and the parties in that, in that arrangement uh, have agreed to the terms, and no one is being defrauded in that situation. The uh, problem is, as a previous caller pointed out, is the third party uh, that did not enter into voluntarily, enter into a, a relationship. Uh, for example, um, one of the things that we libertarians will point out uh, on the environmental issue is the way these things got going is back in the 19th century when uh, people who had apple orchards and such uh, were rightfully complaining um, about the belching smokestack from either the passing train or, or the factory. Um, they had a rightful cause of action. It's called a tort. That's what torts are all about. Uh, you cannot trespass on somebody else's property either with yourself or your trash. And uh, the damage they were seeking redress for that damage, and they were they were being told by the government that well prosperity is more important, uh, you know prosperity for the larger greater number. Right, of people. but that had nothing to. I'm, I'm interrupting you because we're going to have to take a break here in a second. I'll that had nothing to do with limited liability. Yeah. That was just the government taking one side of the struggle rather than the other, which is what always happens. You ask government to be the referee, and it'll always take the side of whoever has the most political influence. Okay, the um, if we're going to share, uh, if we're going to share, uh, have a share of, a, of an entity, a corporation, uh, an enterprise, if we're going to have a share in which we make profit, we cannot 
in good conscience, take the position that we socialize costs. Now, I'm talking not only not not about the people who willingly do business, but I'm talking with I'm talking about the people who are unwillingly dragged into a relationship by trespass, uh, pollution, or they've been harmed by the by the activities of that enterprise, that corporation. Uh, the example in the 19th century was the people who had apple orchards that were being damaged by right. the smokestacks, and, and when they would try to rightfully get redress of grievance, and this is this is the libertarian solution: is you, you get redress. Sure. Or manner, I guess you and if the government if the government uh, rebuff them, then that's a problem of the government taking sides. Exactly. Uh, and and that's not the same problem as the question of limited liability. Well, well the government. Well, yes, it is. I mean, if the, the government's going to say you don't have a case, then it wouldn't matter whether you were bringing against a limited liability company or a person who had complete liability for it. If the government is not going to let you make the case, so what? the question the, the question is, what happens when a corporation trespasses on somebody else or pollutes somebody else's property or creates a problem and the, the suit is brought and the suit involves damages that are greater than all of the net worth of the corporation, do you then go into the individual shareholders' pockets and say you're going to have to cough up more money? And as I told Jeremy before, those cases are so rare that it's really foolish to argue about them. What you find most of all is that the suit is brought against the corporation, the suit is won, won against the corporation, and the corporation does have the assets to pay off the damages on it, and the corporation suffers from it, the managers suffer from it, everybody involved in the corporation suffers from it, but the cases where it exceeds the net worth of the corporation are really lifeboat cases. They are so rare that to throw out the whole concept of limited liability because over a long, long period of time there have been two or three cases where the agreed people did not get full satisfaction for it. Well, but, but we're not talking about throwing out limited liability in the case, uh, for the people with, with whom you voluntarily interact. I understand that. I, we've, we've made that we point are, and we've established that. Right. So what we're talking about is... Uh, and your okay. answer was very similar to the answer that those apple orchard owners were given. No, that's that, not. It's a completely different question. Well, you're, it, you're confusing the question of limited liability with the question of the government simply saying, we're not going to give you any satisfaction at all because we think the, the railroads and the smokestacks are more important to the future of civilization. And, and that's the government it, taking one side or the other. And it, and it wouldn't matter whether it was taking the side of a limited liability company or a, a personal uh, company where one person's fortune was at stake. It's limited, still the government taking sides. The government limited the liability of the, of the, corp, of the companies or enterprises in those cases so that they did not have to uh, did not have to compensate the people who were damaged. But they didn't uh, compensate and, them at all. That's I different that, from I the question. That absolute, but the argument, the argument that, well, in order to, we have this benefit by being able to accumulate capital in a corporation by limiting its liability, which, which is fine in terms of the people who are willingly entering into that relationship, as a, you know, knowing that they're dealing with a limited liability entity. But we're talking about the cases where there are other people who have been who did not choose to be involved. Yeah, we get harmed. Uh, Terry, we, people, we've been over people, this already twice. You understand that, don't you? Well, but, but there, it, the I think the libertarian answer is is that if you you create a moral hazard in the business environment, if you do not have full liability for damages caused by the entity that you have a share of ownership of. All right, but the simple answer might be to say, all right, everybody who's a shareholder in the company is going to be responsible and can be, be uh, taxed in effect to make up the difference, which may what, be the best that? answer even if you're right about all of this, and it may not be the best answer. It may be to make the managers go to prison and work off the, the damages that they've caused or whatever it is, but we're still talking about lifeboat cases. We're talking about cases that are so very rare that I hate to t take the time and talk about it because it's, it's like saying, well, well, what if we're in a lifeboat out in the ocean and you suddenly decide to drill a hole in your end? You're going to drown me as well as yourself. Well, that's fine, but that's, a, that's, a, that's where the expression lifeboat case came from. Why do we even discuss it? Because it's not something that comes up that often in the real world that we need well, to worry about it. Well, you can't sue a corporation that, that, uh, beyond its liability shield. That's why it doesn't come up now, because the government has a law. No, it would, it would come up now, because what, what you would find is far more corporations would be going bankrupt, not because of just simply mismanagement that causes losses that wipe out the net worth of the company, but suits against it of all kinds. And the only time that's happening happening today is when suits are brought against these corporations by the government for not following the government's accounting rules or not following this or not following that. But and what I'm happens not. is the government then bankrupts it, the company and people lose their pensions, people lose their jobs and all of these other things as a result of it. But and those are completely different cases from the kind you brought up. Right. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm I know. About but you have told us what you're talking about. And I've told you what I think about it. And we have agreed to disagree. Well, maybe uh, I've agreed to disagree, and maybe you haven't yet, but I'm afraid I'm going to have to just let you disagree on this, because we have covered this, and we've covered it, and we covered it a third time, and that's all we can really devote to it, Terry. But I thanks, really always. I'm always glad to hear from you. Beg pardon? Okay. Take care. You too. All right, we've gotten a few interesting emails tonight. Uh, one of the things that came up in the convention was the in the debate today between the presidential candidates, those seeking the nomination of the Libertarian Party, was the question of, do you have any strategy for getting into the debates? And Gary Nolan and Michael Bednarik did not really offer any 
astounding strategy, but Aaron Russo said, yes, if they won't let me in the debate, then we will organize civil disobedience, and we will invade the debate, and we will demand uh, participation in the debate, and we will not let them go on with the debate until they let me into the debate. And I'm sorry that I'm paraphrasing him because I don't remember his words word for word, and I, uh, but I believe I've got the gist of it. And uh, Bob, out there in cyberspace, uh, did send an email say, saying, would you advocate bringing, quote, thousands of libertarians, end quote, to the presidential debate forum to protest if libertarians are not representative? Uh, representative, excuse me. It seems to me that's a, not a bad approach. It seems to me, Bob, that it's a very bad approach. Because first of all, you're not going to get in. That's why they have police. And the police are not on our side in this particular case. The police are on the side of the people putting up the debate. And if there is any hint that this is going to happen, then the police that will be guarding that uh, forum will be doubled, tripled, quadrupled, whatever they think is necessary to keep those thousands of libertarians out. So the debate will go on without the libertarians who will be outside chanting and will be on television chanting. And if you were not a libertarian and you were sitting at home and you were shown on the evening news libertarians chanting, let us in the debate, or whatever it is they're going to chant, or they're afraid of us, or whatever great slogan that Aaron Russo can come up with to lead them in, would that make any difference to you? Would you say, oh, my goodness, I want to become a libertarian. Oh, my goodness, these libertarians have got the right idea. Oh, my goodness, those poor libertarians have been excluded. I'm going to run out and vote libertarian. It isn't going to make any difference whatsoever. It was something that sounded good at the convention, and so lots of people cheered when he said it. But when you stop and think about it, it doesn't make any sense at all. I hope I've answered your question, Bob. Kayleen, who we now know is Matthew's wife up there in Massachusetts, said, I watched the debate today on C-SPAN. I was very impressed by all three candidates. I was especially impressed by Aaron Russo's answers and speeches, considering the whining, immature behavior I've seen displayed sometimes in the past. I must say, though, that he is, although he's not a dynamic speaker, I was impressed by his behavior today and his passion for the libertarian cause. My vote is still with Gary Nolan, but I would like to give my kudos to all, kudos to all three. Good job, gentlemen. I made the best libertarian win the ticket. I'd have to second that, that they all three did a, a very credible job. Uh, Christopher, out in cyberspace, says, You once noted that the income tax was like giving the government a blank check to expand hugely. Would you consider that the government taking the dollar off the gold standard might have been the second blank check? Certainly, uh, Christopher, there's no question about the fact that the gold standard was restrained, uh, restrained upon the government and kept the government from being able to do things that it can do now by printing fiat money. And the disaster to the American people by getting off the gold standard and by letting the government have this power can be shown by two simple statistics. Between the time of the revolution... And 1913, when the Federal Reserve System was inaugurated, the consumer price index dropped by about one-third. In other words, prices in 1913 were about one-third lower than they had been in 1800. Since 1913, since we have had a Federal Reserve System with the power to expand the money supply without any restraint whatsoever during most of that period, the result has been that prices are now 13 times what they were in 1913. In other words, prices today are 1,300% of what they were in 1913. And those price increases have become so regular and so systematic that we don't even think about it anymore. We just take inflation for granted. And even now when we hear about low inflation and so on, we're still seeing inflation of 1%, 2 or 3% a year. And, of course, at any time that could break out into 5 or 7 or 10%. And as recently as 1981, the inflation rate was 15% in this country, meaning from one year to the next, prices have gone up by 15%. So, yes, the Federal Reserve System has been a double whammy added to the income tax. But the income tax is probably one of the worst things that has ever been done in this country because, as I've explained before, taxes on imports and excise taxes are self-limiting because the products that are being taxed become more expensive by the tax. And if the taxes get too high, people don't buy the products, the revenue falters, and the result is that the government has to retract the higher taxes. Income taxes are a different story entirely. If they start out at 5% and they don't have enough revenue, they raise it to 10%. People don't stop working when the income tax is 10%. Raise it to 20% and people don't stop working. Raise it to 30% and they don't stop working. After 30% or so, they start. some people start making changes, meaning they find ways of avoiding taxes while still earning money. But the point is that it seems like almost an unlimited supply of money that's available to the politicians. And as a result, it has made possible all of these huge government programs. It's made possible a $2 trillion budget. It made possible World War I. The United States would have never gotten into World War I if it hadn't been for the income tax there to finance it. And if the U.S. hadn't gotten into World War I, as I've said before on this show, I don't think there would have ever been a World War II for reasons we can go into again some other time. All right, a couple of emails before we knock it off tonight. Matt in Salt Lake City, Utah says, do the campaign finance laws forbid anonymous donations to political parties or candidates over $5,000? If such a donation was made via cash only, what would happen? Matt, where have you been the last 30 years? Don't you ever hear these discussions about all this corruption and campaign finance and so on and how we need new, more restrictive laws? You can make cash donations up to something like $100, uh, and I'm not even sure that it's that high. 
But beyond that, everything has to be reported. Everything has to be uh, jotted down and put in a ledger by name, and the FEC will examine it. And if the FEC doesn't, the FEC being the Federal Election Commission, doesn't like the way you keep your books, then you're in trouble. And when you say, if such a donation was made via cash only, what would happen? Well, you and <laughs> the candidate and the campaign manager and maybe a few of dozen other people would wind up in Leavenworth Prison or something similar to that. So, no, the, the interesting thing about all this, as long as we're on the subject, is that I don't know how old you are, but I'm old enough to remember what it was like in the 50s and the 60s. You never heard about campaign scandals. There were never problems about there being too much money, uh, that we needed the government to take this over or anything else, anything of that sort. And nobody ever said, hey, this guy put too much money into somebody's campaign or whatever. None of that happened until the Watergate scandals happened in 1970, in the, from the 1972 election and the investigations in 1973 and the impeachment of Richard Nixon in 74. And that was when they passed the campaign laws. That was when they put the $1,000 limit in, that nobody could give more than $1,000 to a, a presidential campaign. And, of course, various other uh, campaigns for offices have various limits also. And you are allowed to give up to $20,000 to a party, which the party can use to support its presidential candidate and so on, and all these laws. And then suddenly, year after year after year after year, now that the government was involved, we have all kinds of campaign scandals. And it is a continual campaign issue of what we are going to do to clean up campaigns and to get big money out of campaigns and so forth. Well, I'm going to tell you again that we didn't have any of these problems until the campaign finance laws were passed. And so it is, once again, a situation where everything was made worse by the government getting involved. A question from Bob, who asked before about the idea of having a protest at the debates. He follows that up when I said that it wouldn't do any good. He says, is there anything along these lines that we can participate in that may make a difference now? No, offhand, I don't know anything that would specifically get our candidate into the debates. But what I would suggest is that you do whatever you can to support the candidates and to help especially get the Libertarian label more exposure and get more people in the Libertarian Party, get more people to help out in the future. And when we have the numbers, then we can make a difference and we can do it in a way that helps people understand how much better their lives could be if we just got the government out of health care, education, and all of these areas that it has no constitutional authority for participating in. Thanks so much for being with me this evening. I look forward to talking with you again next week. This is Harry Brown, the Radio America Network. Good night.